Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome all. This is Dr. Muhammad Saad, and I would like to welcome you to the course Random Signal Theory. So uh, this course is about probability, and towards the end we have also some statistics uh, that is basically designed for engineering disciplines. So our audience would be students from the various engineering departments. So I welcome you again to the course, and we would like to start with the first chapter that we cover chapter two so it is from your textbook chapter two is about basic probability rules so this chapter is about basic probability rules i know uh, that mostly you have studied probability at school however we don't really need that so as you will notice we start really slow we start from the basic concepts and then step by step we build upon them we build upon these concepts with more advanced concepts towards the end we have uh, quite some advanced concepts. However, as you also know, this course is easy. It's not hard. Uh, and the most important thing that I would like to ask you is to basically be keen to solve the exercises, to solve the examples and problems yourself. So you should be able to, to hide the solution and answer the problems on your own. As long as you can do that, you will be OK. Now. Uh, so that you also know basically what we're talking about. This is the first chapter that we covered, chapter two. From your textbook, you might be asking, where's chapter one? So if you look at the book, chapter one is just a motivation on the importance of this topic. And basically, we are doing this motivation through chapter two, our basic probability chapter. And this is what we are starting with. Now, uh, this course can be motivated by this picture here. So imagine any engineering system. So the engineering system could be anything, like in communications. In telecommunications, the engineering system could be a communication system in which we are sending a message, and then this message will be received by another receiver far away. Uh, it could be a manufacturing process. So basically, we have a machine that manufactures pencils or pens or markers or face masks or whatever. So that system is really something generic. And the system itself would depend on the actual discipline. But that's not really related to us. So for any of these engineering systems, let's for simplicity perhaps stick to the uh, communications example. We have a communication system. And basically, in any communication system, the target is uh, to send a message from a transmitter to another receiver far away. So, uh, usually, usually, if the system is deterministic, deterministic means that the system can be controlled by some variables. So, using our control variable, we might be doing some settings in the system. However, these are controlled variables. We know them, and we do the control by ourselves. Imagine that we do some controls here. We adjust some parameters in the system using the control variables. In that case, if we apply an input, we get an output. If we apply the same input again, we should be getting the same output and so on. Imagine that we have a manufacturing process and basically we adjust our control variables so that we make sure that you manufacture a pencil of a certain size. So that pencil has a certain length, it has a certain diameter, it has certain specifications that we set all using our control variables. In that case, in that case, if we operate the system, we are getting the pencil. If we operate the system again, we are getting exactly the same pencil with the same specifications again. This happens, what I just explained, it happens as long as our system is deterministic. Deterministic means there is no random aspect in the system. However, in real life, things are not always deterministic because we have some noise variables. And as you notice, the noise variables are not the same as the control variables. Control variables are adjustments that we can do by ourselves, but the noise variables are unwanted effects that may affect our system and we cannot really control them, like the errors, the errors that could happen in a manufacturing process. So basically, we adjust our variables. We would like to uh, manufacture that pencil. However, because of some unwanted errors, if we apply the input, 
we get an output. If you apply the same input again, we might get a different output. Although, although we applied the same input, however, the output might be different. Going back to the manufacturing process, we might be apply, we might be operating the system. However, the pencil that we get does not have exactly the length or diameter that we wanted. There could be some plus or minus error, and this comes from the noise variables, and usually the noise variables change at random. So that's why in the manufacturing process we might get errors. Uh, in the telecommunication system, if we send the message, the message might arrive with transmission errors, so we're not getting exactly what we wanted, or the message can get delayed, or the message can get lost, whatever random aspects that can happen basically in a communication system. And this motivates us. So in life, things are not always deterministic. We have some random effects, and this is basically what we would like to study in this course. So let me use the communication system as a motivation again. So in a communication system, imagine uh, that we would like to design a call center. Of course, we know that phone calls might arrive at a certain rate, how many calls per hour, but this is not really fixed. Uh, the number of calls that we might receive can change from time to time. This could be random. Also, the duration of each phone call might be random. So basically, can we do some calculations? In this course, we will learn how to do some calculations. Can we calculate the probability uh, that a certain number of calls would arrive at a certain time. What is the probability uh, that the call duration has this value? So basically, this is our target in this course. Our target in this course is in case we have such random systems, how can we do calculations on the probability? If things change at random, then can we calculate the probability uh, that during this hour we are receiving five calls or six calls. Can we calculate the average number of calls that we are expecting and we call it the expected value or the mean value of calls? So these are the things, basically, these are the calculations that we're interested in learning how to do in this course. Why are they important? They are important because they help us design these systems. So in the call center example, if we can do some calculations about the probabilities of receiving calls, the probabilities of the duration of the calls, expected values or average values, maybe these calculations can guide us to design the system, maybe can guide us to decide what is the capacity that we need, how many employees do we have, how many phone lines do we need. So basically, uh, that's why we are doing these calculations. This course is not about designing the system. This course is just about doing the probability calculations, basically calculating probabilities, calculating averages, calculating expected values. But as a motivation, I think you can imagine that doing these things is important to understand our systems better, to understand how our systems operate, and more importantly, under, uh, basically help us design these systems. So this was our motivation to the course, and we come to the first definition, which is really in the heart of this course. So in the heart of this course comes something called a random experiment. What is a random experiment? A random experiment is basically an experiment that if you do, the outcome is uncertain. The outcome of this experiment is not known in advance. Uh, let me give you a very easy example. Imagine that you toss a coin. You know a coin has two faces. Usually we say heads or tails. The coin has two faces. Imagine it's a fair coin. It's a perfect coin. So uh, there is a 50% chance to get any one of these two outcomes, heads or tails. But if I give the coin, if I give you the coin and I ask you, please toss the coin, what is the outcome? Do you know in advance if you're getting heads or tails? That's impossible. So we don't know. And this is precisely what we call a random experiment. Another easy random experiment that you all know is basically the experiment of rolling a die. The die has six faces. Each one of them has a number, one, two, three, until six. If you roll a die, what are you getting? You might be getting a three or a two or a six or a five or one and so on. So basically, and if you, if you try to do it again, you don't know what you're going to get the next time. 
and each time you can get something different. And this is precisely what we call a random experiment. Formally speaking, an experiment that can result in different outcomes even though it is repeated in the same manner every time is called a random experiment. So again, the random experiment is an experiment that if you do, it might give you it might give you different outcomes and the actual outcome that you are getting whenever you do the experiment is not known in advance it is uncertain this is what we call the random experiment i started with a very easy uh, random experiment examples that you heard about in school like tossing the coin like rolling the die but we have also some other engineering examples let me try to give you two examples from engineering imagine in communications uh, we are sending a message and the target is to deliver th this message to another receiver which is far away from the transmitter. Do we have a random experiment here? Yes, we might have a random experiment due to the unwanted effects of the communication channel. So we are sending the message. Basically, the different outcomes could be the message arrives on time, the message arrives late, the message arrives with errors, the message arrives correctly, the message gets lost, all these things can happen. So even though we repeat the same experiment again, over and over again, we are sending this message. If you do that, the message might arrive correctly and in time. If you do it again, due to the channel variations, due to the communication channel random effects, when you do the same experiment again, the message might arrive late or it might arrive with errors and so on. So this is an example of a random experiment from a communication discipline from communications. I mean from an engineering disciplines, a discipline from communication, but if you imagine something else like a manufacturing process, or let me mention a very easy, a uh, very easy example again. Imagine I give you a very thin wire. That wire is maybe less than one millimeter in diameter and I give you a measuring tool, I give you a precise measuring tool and I ask you please measure the thickness of the wire and tell me the thickness. Will you give me the same answer every time if I give it to the first student and then I give the same wire to the second student? I can hear 0 0.5 millimeters. The second student might tell me 0 0.52 millimeters. The third one might tell me 0 0.49 millimeters. The wire is very thin. The measuring tool might have precision problems. Also the precision of your eye and all these things. You might give me different answers every time and this is a random experiment. I just give you the same wire and I tell you measure the thickness. So the answers that you might give me might change from time to time. So this is another type of random experiment. Let me continue. Still in our motivation to the importance of this course. Going back to the call center. Imagine that we have a call center and we have phone calls that arrive. Here in this part of the figure we have a deterministic system. Imagine that phone calls arrive exactly every five minutes. So this is the first call at time zero. This is the first call and then the green line is the duration of the call. Let's say the duration is less than five minutes, something like 4.9 minutes or so. So the first call ended here and the second call started here. So the second call arrived after the first one was finished. So will the second call go through or will it find a busy tone? Obviously it will go through. So the second call comes exactly at time five and it finishes before time 10. The third call arrives at time 10 and it finishes before time 15. The fourth call arrives at time 15 and so on. We have a deterministic system. Calls arrive exactly every five minutes and the duration of each call is slightly less than five minutes. So in advance, we know everything. We know that each one of these calls will go through. All these calls will be successful because the duration of each call is less than five minutes and the calls arrive exactly every five minutes. Now look at the second half of the figure and this is an example of a random system as opposed to deterministic. Imagine for simplicity, imagine that calls still arrive every five minutes. So imagine, assume that this is something we know in advance. We are receiving the first call at time zero, the second call at time five, the third call at time 10, and so on. However, the duration of each call is random. I don't know exactly how long each phone call is. It might be a call center and people are calling 
because they have a technical problem or because they want to book a ticket and so on and different people might have different circumstances so the first call was only like 1.5 minutes long it finished here so when the second call arrived the first call was finished already so the second call will go through the second call will be successful however that second call is long it lasts like seven minutes as you notice from time 5 until time 12 this is the duration of the second call so what about the third call if it arrives exactly at time 10 when the third call arrives the system is busy because the second call is not finished yet that's why the third call has to be blocked as you notice in telephone systems as long as we have one line we cannot have two calls at the same time so the third call is blocked and in life in real communication systems or in engineering systems in life in general this is what we're expecting to happen as opposed to the pure deterministic system so again in this course uh, you will learn how to deal with this so basically can you calculate the probability that any call gets blocked maybe can you calculate the probability that a call goes through or is successful and so on on average what is the duration of each phone call and so on. So these are the type of things that you will learn how to calculate in this course. And we are using these examples as a motivation to the course. Let's go back again. Uh, I mean, let's continue with our second important definition, the sample space. Let me backtrack here. We defined the random experiment. So what is the random experiment again? The random experiment is an experiment that if you do, you get an uncertain outcome. The outcome that you're getting every time is not certain, is not known in advance. Now we would like to start from there and continue. Let's define the sample space. Now, if we have a random experiment, we just said that the outcome is not certain. We don't know exactly what we are getting. However, the set of all possible outcomes of the experiment is known in advance and this is what we call the sample space. So the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes of a random experiment. Usually we use the letter S to denote the sample space. I think the best thing to do here is to try to give you an example. Some sample space examples and I like to start with the easy ones and after we finish those we are continuing with more examples uh, from uh, basically more engineering examples. Now, the first experiment that we deal with here is we toss a coin and we observe the outcome. We have a coin that has heads and tails. If you toss this coin, what are the possibilities? What is the set? of all possible outcomes. The set of all possible outcomes is heads or tails. These are the two things that may happen if you toss the coin. Don't make a mistake. We don't know what you're getting if you toss the coin. However, we know the set of possibilities, the set of possible outcomes, and this is what we call the sample space. So the sample space for this experiment, we toss a coin and we simply observe the outcome. We observe the outcome means you look which face you have uh, obtained. and Basically, the set of all possible outcomes is heads or tails. Now, if you do the experiment, are you getting heads or tails? This is what we don't know. But can you get anything different from these two outcomes? No, this is the sample space. Let's expand a bit. Our experiment is we toss two coins and we observe the outcome. I give you two coins and I tell you toss them and observe the outcomes, tell you what you have seen. Now, if you toss two coins, what are the possibilities? Both of them are heads, heads, tails. The second possibility, the first coin is a head and the second coin is a tail. The third possibility, the first coin is a tail and the second coin is a head. The last possibility, both coins are tails. Do we have any other possibility? Do we, can you imagine any other possible outcome? For this simple experiment, we toss two coins and we observe the outcome? I don't think so. So this is our sample space. However, when you do the experiment now, if I give you the two coins and you do the experiment, which one of them will you get? This is what we don't know. That's why we call it a random experiment. However, the set of all possible outcomes can be calculated in advance and it's really related to the concept. It's related to the context of the experiment. We toss two coins and we observe the outcome. Why did I keep saying we observe the outcome? Why didn't I just say we toss 
two coins because the sample space depends on the on what you actually observe that's why let me go to the third example in which the experiment looks very similar to the second one however with a twist so we have a change here so what is the experiment we toss two coins and we observe the number of heads so I give you two coins and I tell you please tell me how many heads have you seen I did not tell you give me the outcome two heads or two tails and so on I did not tell you observe the outcome I told you observe the number of heads that you have seen now if you toss two coins what are the possibilities regarding the number of heads can we get two heads yes if both coins are heads then the number of heads is two can we get only one head yes that's also possible you toss two coins if one of them is a head and the other one is a tail then the number of heads is one can the number of heads be zero yes if you toss your coins and you get tails tails if you get this outcome this corresponds to zero heads now our sample space contains the numbers zero one or two so have you seen the difference do you notice that this sample space is not the same as this sample space because it depends on what we observe so we have an experiment we toss two coins and we simply observe the outcome for this experiment the sample space is heads 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 tails tails heads tails tails however if we toss the coins and we observe the number of heads then the sample space contains zero and one and two if the experiment changes into we toss two coins and we observe the number of tails now it's the same the sample space is still zero or one or two because these are the possible number of tails again we toss two coins and we observe the number of heads zero or one or two can we get anything negative that does not make any sense for this experiment can we get three that's also impossible it does not make sense because in our experiment we have only two sorry we have only two coins the last simple experiment that we cover is basically we roll a die you know the die has six faces from one to six so we are getting one of those so what is the sample space it's simply this is a typo here we don't have the zero sorry we don't have the zero and our sample space simply contains one two three until six this is our sample space it contains only six outcomes if you are rolling a die let's move on to some other examples uh, we have a series of examples here that look similar to each other however every time we just twist what we are observing and every time we have a different sample space so if I give you a wire it's a thin wire and I give you a measuring tool and I ask you what is the thickness of this wire what is your answer you uh, your your answer would be a number that represents the thickness does this number have to be an integer number does it have to be one or two or three no it can be anything even 0 0.56 0 0.29 and so on so the sample space is the set of all positive real numbers all positive real numbers uh, since the wire has a thickness that's why it's not expected to to get a zero as the outcome the zero is not a possible thickness and the thickness cannot be negative so our sample space basically is any number which is positive so the set of positive real numbers using a uh, set uh, basically expression we can say all numbers x such that x is greater than zero this is basically the set of all possible outcomes that we call the sample space in short we can just say r plus the set of all positive real numbers this is the sample space however if you do the experiment if I now give you the wire and they tell you please measure the thickness you will just give me one answer which is coming from this thick uh, from this sample space okay let's change the example a little bit a little bit imagine I give you the wire to measure and I know beforehand that all my wires have a thickness between 10 and 11 millimeters I know that beforehand and I ask you please measure the thickness of the wire so what is the sample space what is the set of all possible outcomes it is the set of all thicknesses between 10 and 11 so we can say the set of all numbers such that the number X is between 10 and 11 so this would be our sample space it's not the set of all positive real numbers because we know that all thicknesses are between 10 and 11 so the sample space is the set of all numbers between 10 
and 11. Have you noticed something here? Of course, it will be a topic in future chapters, but let me, let me make a comment here. In this example, in which we're tossing two coins and we're observing the outcome, or even better, in this experiment, we toss two coins and we observe the number of heads. What was the sample space? The sample space contained zero and one and two. Do you notice the difference between this set and this set here that you see all values between 10 and 11? How many values between 10 and 11 can we have? It's infinitely many. Although it's just between 10 and 11, but it could be from 10.0001, 10 10.05679, uh, 10.678 and so on. So it is all possible values between 10 and 11 and we have infinitely many such values. And we say that this sample space here, this kind of sample space is a continuous sample space. It is basically defined by a continuous range of numbers between 10 and 11 and the outcome can be anything between 10 and 11 in the continuous range. However, this kind of sample space is a discrete sample space. Discrete, yani متقطع, عكس متصل, it is the opposite of continuous. So we have zero and one and two, this or that or that, as long as we can point to them, as long as we can point our count, zero, one, two, we say it's a discrete sample space and uh, basically discrete versus continuous uh, will be our focus in the future chapters in chapter three and four, inshallah. Okay, so let me uh, continue our sample space examples here. We are still in the wire example. I give you a thin wire and I tell you measure the thickness, but I'm not interested in the thickness itself. Imagine, imagine that some wires have a low thickness, some wire have a medium thickness, some wire have a high thickness. Let's say if the thickness is less than 10, we say it's low thickness. If the thickness is between 10 and 11, we call it a medium thickness. If the thickness is more than 11, we say it's a high thickness. And our experiment again is I give you a wire and I ask you, please tell me, is the thickness low or medium or high. So I'm not interested in the thickness as a number itself. I just want to know, does it have a low or medium or high thickness? So in that case, this would be your answer. If after you measure the wire, you would tell me low or medium or high. So this is our sample space. It contains only low or medium or high. Let's even move on. I still give you the wire, so our example, our experiment still depends on the thin wire and the measuring tool. Uh, I say that wires have specifications. Imagine that I want all my wires to be between 10 and 11 millimeters. This is my requirement, this is my specification. Now, if you measure it and you find it's between 10 and 11, we say that the wire conforms to specification. It's a yes, yes, it conforms to specifications. However, if the wire is too thin or too thick, we say it does not conform to specifications. So this is the explanation. Let me uh, basically uh, mention the experiment again. So what is the experiment here? The experiment is as follows. I give you a wire and then I ask you, please measure the wire and tell me, does it conform to specifications or not? In that case, what is the sample space? The sample space contains only a yes or a no. So if you measure the wire, you would tell me, yes, it conforms to specifications. The wire is good. Or no, it does not conform to specifications. The wire is not good. In that case, this is what we're interested in. This is what we observe. And this would be the corresponding sample space. Now imagine if I give you two wires. I tell you, please tell me the thickness of both wires. In that case, the outcome is two numbers two real numbers, so R plus times R plus the set of all pairs of two numbers and each one of the numbers is a positive real number. This, this would be the sample space. Now let me build it up a little bit. Imagine I give you two wires here in this example. I give you two wires and I tell you, uh, observe whether they conform to specifications or not. I give you two wires, please measure them using the measuring tool and tell me if they conform to specifications or not. In that case, what is the set of all possible outcomes? There is only four possibilities. Both wires conform to specifications, which is a yes, yes. The first wire conforms and the second wire does not conform. 
which is the yes no or the first wire does not conform but the second one conforms which is a no yes finally the possibility of both wires don't conform to specifications since our experiment is measure the wires and tell me whether they conform to specifications or not so basically that's our sample space it contains yes 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 no no yes and no no finally let me just stick to this example i give you two wires i tell you measure them and give me please observe how many wires the number of wires that conform to specifications what are the possibilities how many wires can possibly conform to specifications if you measure them and you find that both of them do not conform in that case the number of conforming ones will be zero if you measure the wires you find that one of them conforms and the other one no in that case the number of conforming is one if you measure the wires and you find that both are okay both are good both conform to specifications in that case the number of conforming ones is two so our sample space in this case is zero or one or two so as you have noticed in all these experiments we have wire and we measure the thickness but depending on what we observe that tweaks or changes the experiment a little bit and from case to case we have a sample space so basically what was the take-home message from these examples if we have a random experiment we can construct the sample space that's the only thing that we have done let me stop here and just mention one last issue here which we call a tree diagram it's again it's a way to construct the sample space and it's uh, it's basically very useful in case our experiment has stages that are repeated. So imagine that we have the following example here. So the best way to learn this is through the example right away. Imagine that we are sending three communication messages. This is our experiment. We are sending message one and then message two and then message three. For each one of the messages, for each one of the messages, we have two possibilities. The message arrives on time or the message arrives late what is the sample space for the whole experiment that contains three messages we have three messages so i think maybe uh, you can imagine that we have a possibility that all messages arrive on time so on time on time on time or all messages arrive late 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 and then everything in between all combinations in between so what is an easy way to construct all these combinations is to use what we call a tree diagram a tree diagram it works as follows we start with the first uh, step of the experiment which is the sending of message one for message one we have two possibilities on time or late and then we go to the second part of the experiment in which we send message two now if the first one was on time what are the possibilities for the second one on time or late however if the first one was late what are the possibilities for message two again on time or late and then once we finish the second stage we go to the third stage now for the third message what are the possibilities again on time or late so when the second one was on time the third one could be on time or late when the second one was late the possibilities for the third again are on time or late so we do it for all cases so this is basically the first experiment i mean the first uh, part of the experiment we have one experiment in which we're sending three messages in the first phase we send message one what are the possibilities for the first message on time or late now for the second message uh, given that the first one is on time the possibilities for the second is on time or late however given that the first one was late the possibilities for the second message are on time or late and so on we do the same thing for the third message and now to construct the sample space we just look at the ends of the tree diagram these points here which are basically eight one two three four five six seven eight that eight comes from the fact that we have three messages and for each message for each message we have two possibilities on time or late two to the power of three is eight however how can we construct our sample space for the whole experiment that has three message we just follow the three branches on time on time on time so this is the first outcome in the sample space on time on time on time 
The second outcome is on time, on time, late. The third outcome is on time, late, on time, on time, late, late is the fourth outcome and so on. The last outcome is late, late, late. The second to last, the one just before the last was late, late, on time and so on. So that's how we can construct the sample space uh, of such a composite experiment in which we have different phases like message one, message two and message three. Let me stop here and we will continue with our next video inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.